Morning, everyone. I know we're all visiting, and some of us are probably tired from waiting in the lines at Boxing Day sales. That's today. <laughs> it, uh, we're still warming up. Our furnace went out last night in the middle of the night. So our house is slowly coming up to a livable temperature. I still can't quite feel my toes, but it'll come back. We woke up, it was 11 degrees in our house, so it wasn't bad. It's good, right? Uh, Nathan and Mary decided to, to stay home because of the cold and the snow that they're getting, so I, uh, we're not going to have singing. I'm not going to sing. You don't have to worry. You don't have to run for the hills. And I have, I have a, a, a brief message. It's, a, it's not a long message. They're never long, right? I keep you guys, keep you guys the right amount of time. But I wanted to share this message this morning and just kind of prepare for where we're going in the in the new year, starting with next week. Um, so I, I entitled today's message "It's Time, uh, Time to Build," and, and it really goes along with what we've been talking about over the past number of weeks. So I really or the past couple of weeks, past few months. So I really wanted to just kind of prepare us for 2022 to set us off on the right foot. So we're just going to pray, and then I'm, you're going to listen to me babble, and then we can hang out and have some coffee and visit uh, before we head out. And for those of you watching online, you can have coffee now, but don't visit till I'm done. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for your goodness, for your, for your love that you pour upon us. Thank you that right now we get to experience and celebrate the Christmas season, Father. God, I thank you that we have warm houses to, to live in, in in these cold days that we have sometimes. And Father, I thank you for your protection and your love. God, we pray for those that uh, are unable to join us today due to illness or due to being away with family. Father, we pray that you'll just bless them and just be with their time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So yeah, as I said, today I want to talk about something called It's Time, and, and the series is Time to Build. And, and does it, has anybody ever gone to like a, a conference or a convention before, like a, a church one? Some of you might have gone to like a youth convention or um, YCs or men's mighty men's conference i think gary you've gone to some of them or you know even even the gideon conventions and stuff that have happened happened around and there's always these conventions and i remember as a teenager going to to youth conventions and these teachings from god's words and i remember going to saskatchewan youth convention and i remember going to uh, alberta yc youth their youth convention and i remember going to alberta a lot when it started with you know a couple thousand people and I remember that was in Red Deer, and they had like half, not even half of the hockey rink there, which is about the size of Sass Place. Uh, half of that blocked off, and there was about 2,000 of us. And then I remember years later being there at Rexall or Rogers Center or whatever it was called at the time, Skyreach for a while in Edmonton. And I remember there being there with like 18,000 youth, right? And I remember just what a, what a great time it was. And I remember just having this, this hunger for God's word and this, this realness that he was there and he was real. And, and it, as I was thinking about that through this past Christmas season and just the, the environment that we live in, and I was, Ella was talking to us today, or yesterday night even, about this, but through everything that's happening in the world today, there has been a, I don't want to say uprising, but there's been a rising up of various different people groups around the world today. And there's been a rising up of different opinions. But the other thing that has happened is there has been a rising up within our youth to take a stand for God. And I don't think that we have been fully, um, a full understanding of that. You know, there's been this negative side of what's going on with our youth where there's been this depression, there's been sadness, there's been, you know, 
attempted suicide, suicide, all these things happening in our youth. But there's also been this group that has been rising up and standing for Christ and, and making a shift. And, and, you know, one generation can rise up and can bring us along with it if we consider ourselves not in that generation. I'm going to say we're all part of that generation and we can all rise up with these youth. And, and we don't have to say, well, that's their thing. But we can join them and rise up together and, and stand arm to arm, shoulder to shoulder, rising up as a nation for Jesus. That's what I believe. I believe that the stuff that when we would go to youth conventions and different conferences and conventions, that we would come out of there feeling as we press into him each day, we can experience that in our life every day. We need to be a group that, that abides in Jesus because if we don't, the other side of that is that group that is, is falling off their faith, that is losing their faith, that is not walking and living in faith. We can be the group that rises up or we can be the group that is losing the battle. Do you know what I'm saying? And as I said Christmas Eve, the choice is ours how we're going to respond, how we're going to live, how we're going to act. And abiding in Jesus, letting his, his word abide in you, connecting with him daily, living by faith, you know, building by faith even, with words of faith in our lives. Uh, 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 the sword of the spoken word of God in our life as we talked about this past year. Faith in his stunning ability that he has given us. The limitless possibilities when we live with him and in him. Faith. This, this life of faith. It's, see, it's time to build. It's not time right now to hunker down and hide and to, to stay warm or stay comfortable. But it's actually time to build. It's time for the church to grow and to rise up and build. Far too often churches play it safe. And I think, I think we've done a great job here as a church of not just playing it safe. We're not trying to just play church. We're actually wanting to build something. Right? We want to build. It's time to build. For lack of better terms, it's time to grow up. It's time to put on our big boy pants, big girl pants, whatever you want to put on. Great red lipstick, and let's 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 put it on and let let's. It's time to build, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, it's time to build. So I have a bunch of scriptures I want to read, and then I want to talk. Can you bear with me on that? So it says in Colossians 2, 9 and 10, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So the expandable, expanded Bible says it like this, and I don't know if I have it up there as a slide, so I might not. It says this, so, All of God lives fully in Christ, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in a human body, bodily embodied. And you have a full and true life in Christ. You've been filled in him who is ruler, the head over every ruler and power authority. See, faith, when we live in faith, faith is always what? It's always building, isn't it? When we live a life of faith, it's always building, it's always growing, it's always multiplying. But when, when you look at the opposite, it's opposing thoughts. It's doubts. It's misbeliefs. It's people getting focused on their five senses. Five senses. That's what lack of faith is. It's focusing on the five senses. What you can see, what you can hear, what you can taste, touch, or smell. And, and when we start focusing on those and not the, the overarching power in the Spirit and in the Word of God and in His promises. When we just focus on those five things, our five senses, that's completely at war with faith. It's at war with faith. And we need, we need to break out of those five senses as a church, as people, 
as God's people, as followers of Christ, as lovers of God. We need to break out of those, and we need to start. We need to, it's time to build. That's what I'm trying to say. It's time to build. Romans 8, 6 to 7 says, For to be carnally minded is death. Your five senses is carnally minded. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is opposed and hostile towards God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We live or walk by what we believe or our faith. Not by what we can see or by our sight. One of the senses. Romans 1, 17 says, For in the gospel a righteousness which God ascribes is revealed both springing from faith and leading to faith, to close through that, the, the way of faith that arouses to more faith. As it is written, the man who through faith is just and upright shall live and shall live by faith. A life of faith. And another version reads this, and I think I do have this one up. Okay. If you... You see, in the good news, God's restorative justice is revealed. And as we will see, it begins with and ends in, in faith. And the scripture declares, by faith, the just will obtain life. And that's, that's from the voice. And then we jump. I said there's a bunch of scriptures I'm going to hit you with, okay? Acts 3.16 says, and his name through and by faith in his name, has made this man whom you see and recognize well and strong. Yes, the faith which is through and by him, Jesus, has given this man the perfect soundness of body before all of you. And then Romans 3.28 says, For we hold that a man is justified and made upright by faith, independently of and distinctly apart from good deeds or works of the law. The observance of the law has nothing to do with justification. So we, we start, as we start walking through faith, and as we start talking about how it's time to build, then we start getting questions about this idea of justification, and how does that work with me, and am I justified, am I not justified? If you're in English, you're maybe right justified or left justified. That's a bad word joke. Don't note it. I barely got even a chuckle. That's, you guys must have had too much turkey or ham yesterday. But we start talking about what makes us right with God. And we're going to talk about this more in the upcoming weeks. But Romans 5, 1 to 2 says, Therefore, since we have been made right with God, declared, I'm really emphasizing that, because it has nothing to do with us, but we've been declared righteous and justified by our faith, we have peace with God. This happened through our Lord Jesus Christ, who through our faith has brought us into the blessing of, through whom we have access by faith to God's grace that we can now enjoy, in which we stand and live. And we are happy, we rejoice, we boast because of the hope we have of sharing or by, of experiencing God's glory. We've talked about this scripture lots throughout this past year, if you remember. And if you, have, if you don't remember, well, go back and watch this past year's sermons all online. And if you don't know, if you haven't seen it, if you're watching online or here for the first time, go back and watch this, the messages. Because these are all verses that we've talked about throughout the year. I'm just compiling them all quickly into one. Hebrews 10.38 says, Those who are right with me will live by what? By faith. John 3.30 tells us what? It says, He must become greater, he must increase, and I must become less important. I must decrease. This is what we talked about in our last series, right? Elevating him, and he's going to elevate us, but it's not up to me to elevate myself. It's up to me to elevate 
Him. I must put Him on the pedals. I must glorify Him. I must show everybody I con come in contact with Him. Yeah, I must show God to everyone, Jesus to all, and allow Him to elevate me because I don't need to pick myself up. I don't need to make myself righteous or, or put myself on the pedestal, adjust these lights so I shine bright. That has nothing to do with it. I don't need to look better for you people. I need to elevate Him and do my best to elevate Christ in all that I do. It's not about trying to make me look good. It's all about Jesus. Inside of you, Jesus must increase. In your life, Jesus needs to increase. As we come and contact people, Jesus. Right? It's about Jesus. See, our desire to be noticed, our desire to be famous, that needs to decrease. And let Christ's love come out of us, permeate out of us, and it needs to increase. His strength needs to increase. His love, his joy, his fame needs to increase. It all needs to increase. And I need to decrease. It's amazing the things you can do if you don't care about getting the credit yourself. Have you ever noticed that? If it's like, oh, let, me, uh, let me shovel the sidewalks and let, let's make sure everybody sees me. I'm going I'm to call at everybody and text them and make sure they come to church at 10.20 today because that's when I'm going to be outside shoveling. So everybody's going to be like, oh, Dave, you don't have to do that. Oh, come. you're such a good guy. Here, let me get you a hot chalk. You know, it's, that's, not what, that's not a servant's heart. That's a, look what I did. Somebody come pat me. Bill, come pat me on the back. Right? That's what that is. Sometimes it just happens because that's when people are showing up that you get there at 10, 20 and you're shoveling. But you know what I'm saying, right? I hope I'm clear on that. It's amazing the things you can do, though, in life when you don't, aren't focused on trying to get the credit yourself. See, we need to get a picture of Jesus in the Word. We need to realize that He is... He has lived out this example here on earth of who we are to be. The things that we are to do, how we are to pray, all these pieces. He's lived this out and shown us. And it's captured in his word. It's the example he's given us. See, we have this example of Jesus. Not the historical, you know, Jesus that walked on the shores of Galilee or not the six pound, eight ounce baby Jesus or whatever he weighed when he was born. That's just the perfect weight, it seems. Six pound, eight ounces. I've had five kids. Well, my wife's had five kids. I think that just, just doesn't that make sense? Is that a good size, Elaine? Six pound, eight ounces? I don't know. That's why I just keep going back to that when I say baby Jesus. But that's not... That, but we're actually talking about the example. The risen Lord, the King of Kings, our victorious, victorious Savior who came to earth only and only came to this earth to conquer the grave for us, to bring life for us. That's why Jesus came, not, not to be this baby wrapped in swaddled in cloth lying in a manger for the wise men to come worship and the, the shepherds to come and all that stuff. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the risen Lord. The Jesus that came to earth to be victorious, to be our victorious Savior, to, to conquer the grave for us. As I shared on Christmas Eve, this year's been a tough year. We've lost some people. But Jesus conquered the grave. And as we start talking about Jesus, we start really, we need to start looking at the awesomeness of Jesus. And I don't even know if awesomeness is, is a word. If Carrie was here, she'd tell me it's a word or not. Is it a word? We're going to say it's a word, even if it's not, right? The awesomeness of Jesus, that's what really matters. That's when we're living our life. That's what we need to be living according to is how amazing and awesome is Jesus. The example he set, the things that he did. That's, that's our example. The man at, uh, at the right hand of God who loved me, who died for me, now lives forever advocating for me. 
He was God's answer to the cry of humanity. He was God coming to our five senses. He was the intrusion into the physical realm that we have today. See, he talked like God, he acted like God, he lived like God, and on the cross he died like God. He wasn't a philosopher searching for truth. He was the truth. He wasn't a mystic. He was reality. He was not an experimenter searching for reality. He was not a reformer. He wasn't a recreator. He was not a visionary. He was and is the light of the world. He never reflected. He never reasoned. He knew. He was truth. He never sought the help of man. He was never in a hurry. Like, if it was me, and all these kids are trying to pile on me, and the, the, the disciples are like, hey guys, like, get away, go kids. And he's like, whoa! Let these kids come to me. Let them know me. I'm, I'd be like the disciples, right? Like, let's go, come on guys, let me do my thing. I got places to be, people to meet, adults to talk to. Right? How many of us would be like that? Am I the only one that sounds like a jerk? <laughs> right? But, but Jesus is like, no, come to me. Let them come to me. I want to I talk to them. He was never in a hurry. He was never afraid. Like, you think back to the garden. Not Adam and Eve garden. The other garden. When the Roman soldiers came for him, Right? And they're like, where is this Jesus? And he didn't say, oh, hide me. Somebody put a cloak over me so I can hide. It's me. I'm here. He wasn't afraid. Like, man, here, take my kids. I'm out of here. That's what it been, might have been me, maybe, if I knew what was coming. Don't think less of me. You might have done it too. But Jesus said, here I am. I am he. Take me. He never showed weakness. He never hesitated. He was there. He was always ready. He was sure. There was sureness in all that he did, all that he said. He had no sense of sin or any need for forgiveness. He never sought any advice from those around him. He knew why he came to this earth. He knew where he came from. He knew who he was. He was secure in the Father. He knew about heaven. He knew where he was going. He knew man. This Jesus, he knew, he knew man. He knew God. He knew Satan. And Jesus had no sense of luck. He had no sense of limitations. These are the examples of things that he set out for us to live by. There's no sense of limitations. But yet too many believers want to live in the sense of limitations because we're living in these, right? The five senses. And when you look at Jesus... From when he was arrested to when he was hung on that cross, what did you have? You had no sense of fear. Did, did he ever seem fearful in any of the things that we've read? He had no anger through that. Like, we all know this story of the cross and the crucifixion from the Bible, right? Did he say, you idiots, Get off me. But do we not read, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? That doesn't sound like somebody who's angry or fearful. He had no sense of disappointment. He, there was no sense of being defeated. He had no sense or need of human sympathy through what we read. He didn't shrink from pain or brutal treatment. As I said earlier, he was the master when they arrested him. It's me. I'm Jesus. Take me. 
When Peter, who probably, maybe I might not have responded quite like I said, of throwing the kids in the way, but I might have been like Peter because, I don't know, I think, I think what Peter did was kind of cool because it seems like something I might do. But grab the sword and cut off the guy's ear, right? What did Jesus do? He said, no, I'll show you how to do it. Let's get the other ear. That's not what he said. He grabbed the ear and put it to the guy's head and healed him. Like, seriously. I might have picked up the ear. Can you hear me now? You know what I mean, though? Like, no, he put the ear to the guy's head and healed him. When they arrested him, he was the master of the trial. He ruled the seen and the unseen when he was on the cross. He was almighty. He was, he was God on that cross, yet a man. And he died as God. Now, when I look to Jesus after, what a weird message for a Christmas type message, right? But when I look to to Jesus after the resurrection, after his death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection, before the ascension, when I look at that, do you see any sense of revenge? Like he doesn't get to, okay, disciples, come here. Let's get our game plan. Okay, and we huddle in and, okay, we're going to get them, guys. Okay. So you're going to button hook around the Roman with the right with the thing on his face, and you're going to do a, a fly pattern here with a guy with a scar over his eye, and I'm going to go in and I'm going to punch him in the groin. Like that wasn't happening, was it? No, there was none of that. He had no sense of revenge. He was love, wasn't he? He was a revelation of a new kind of love. There were no dramatics. He died a lamb and rose as the Lord. He rose as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He acted like God. He spoke like God. His resurrection had all the simplicity of God. He was God. And his words are spirit and life. And and his words are words that we can live by and walk with and, and utilize. His example is one that we can move forward with as believers, as followers of Christ because it's time. It's time to build as the church. It's not time to cower. It's time to rise up, stand up, and advance the kingdom of God. As we spoke a lot last year, we're going to keep going next year of we are going to advance the kingdom of God. We're going to take ground for the kingdom. Not for our glory, not for, oh, look at Rosetown Community Church, but for Jesus has nothing to do with Rosetown Community Church. It has nothing to do with David. It has nothing to do with any of you. It has everything to do with him. See, his words are spirit and life. Jesus knew the value and authority of his words. He dared to say the words that others might think of saying but never say. He knew the power of his words. He knew that his words, and gave us the example of words bringing life and death. It's an example we talked about this year. Remember the the fig tree? And how it died from the roots up? He knew that. He knew the power of his words. His words could bring life and death, just like our words can bring life and death. Just like he spoke to that fig tree and said, no fruit's going to come from you, and it died from the roots up. What did he say to the widow's son? Get up. And and the, the boy, the man, rose up and became alive instantly. Life and death. Through the same words, well, through the words through the same person. You know what I'm trying to say. See, we have access to that same power, that same authority that has been given to us. 
And we need to start living and speaking words of life over ourselves and over our family and over our church and over our community. Not words like, oh, the sky is falling. But speak life. Because to me, when I hear the sky is falling, I think, well, death, and I think chicken little. And Jesus didn't come on the cross and die on the cross and resurrect from death and ascend to heaven to advocate for me to God and sit on his right hand for me to be chicken little. Jesus did all that so we can be people of faith. So we can be men of faith, men of authority, men of power, and women. But you know what I mean. It doesn't matter, right, Kat? See, it's the word that brings us eternal life. It's his words. It's his life that he has given us. It's the faith-building word. It's the grace-revealing word. It's the words of assurance that he has spoken over us. See, the word, the word is the testimony of what God did through Jesus here on earth. That's the testimony of that. The word is also our testimony of what has been done in our lives through Christ. And that word of that testimony of what we have, what we have come through, where, where we are, is something that we need to share daily with each other. It's the word of faith when we preach and talk. See, what I'm doing up here is just talking like you guys do every day, wherever you go, when you tell about the goodness of God in your life. Right? You're sharing your testimony. Bill and I talk about sharing our testimonies and how critical and important it is to our lives. It's something that we need to share wherever we go. We need to share our testimony with each other, with, with the community, so they know. I'm sure people come to my house, or workers, and come and do stuff, and, oh, that's a, he's a pastor? Weird, I've never seen a pastor with a mohawk. Oh, another goody two-shoes. Come, let me tell you my story, man. Hear what Jesus did in my life. These are the opportunities, because now you can elevate him. When we abide in his word and are his disciples, things change. When we know the truth, what does it do? It sets us free. And probably one of the lines they like to quote from a movie I've never seen from Braveheart, but we get freedom! Even though not quite that's the line, but you know, they yell freedom. I don't know the movie. Don't worry about it. I just know that we have freedom. That's all that matters. When we abide in his word, when we live his word out, when we spend time with the Father, when we get to know Jesus, when our home is the word... When we abide in the word and we abide in Jesus and we declare our rights and they come into being, we can live a different life, don't we? We have a different life available. So, and if you're not doing that, if you're not living that out, if you're not acting that way, if you're not acting like you have freedom, then it's time. It's time to build as a church. It's time to advance the kingdom. It's time to take ground. Because we've already got the freedom! But it's time to take it. When we live a different life, life takes on a new power. It takes on a new meaning. Take a look at the word of God. Start speaking the word of God as we've talked about all year. When we spend time in the Word of God, it is God speaking to us. It's a part of God himself. The Word of God is a living thing, and it abides forever in us and for us. So we need to start living by it. We need to to spend time reading it, because that is God expressing himself to us. It is a love letter to us about his goodness and what he did through the cross, through the burial of Jesus, through the resurrection, through the ascension. That's what it's telling us. How much he loves us. See, God lives in his word, and he lives on our lips as we speak it. And as we speak the word of God, as we speak the words of Jesus, 
We speak Jesus. And it sets Jesus free in the world around us to, to heal people, to save people, to bless people. See, because Jesus is the word as well. Because Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit are three in one. And he lives in his word. His word brings life. His word brings wholeness. And his word brings healing. <clears throat> his word is full of promises which are true for us today. So, maybe you're saying, oh, it's time for you to be done. I'm saying it's time for us to build. It's time for us to advance. Do you want me, I'm going to go through this whole rant again. Okay? Because it's time. It's time for us to build. It's time for us to advance the kingdom of God and take ground that is intended for him, but we've let the devil and people have far too much access to that land. We've had allowed people to speak into the church, speak in our lives, too much negativity and death, and we need to advance the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there is no fear, there's no death, there's no, I'm going to be a scaredy cat, the sky is falling, but I'm going to advance the kingdom. When warriors advance, they don't. Oh no, you go first. But they move forward together. That's what we're to do as the church. And I hope you're ready for 2022 because it's time. It's time to build. And we're going to be talking about the awesomeness of Jesus and, and all these things and the, some of the characteristics of Jesus. And we're going to talk about how they apply to our life in the new year. So I hope you're ready to build. We're not going to be Bob the Builder but we're gonna be working with the best builder around. And we're gonna elevate Jesus this year even more. And we're gonna recognize his lordship over our lives even greater. And we are gonna to get to know the Father, and we're gonna to get to know Jesus, and we're gonna to get to know the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives through his word this year. And we're gonna to get to know each other in a whole new level this year. Would you guys stand as we pray? God, we love you. We honor you. We give you praise. We give you glory. God, we are so thankful for the life you give us. We, th we are thankful for the life that you have given us through your word, through the, the, the words that you speak, through the Holy Spirit in our lives, as we walk out the power and authority that has been given to us. Father, we know that there is no room for falseness in our lives. But God, I pray that as the church, as a group of believers, that we are ready. It is time to build. God, we are thankful that you have called us as your church, as your bride, to build something together for you. God, I pray that as we approach 2022, Father, and as we, we cross into 2022, even this year, this week, God, I pray that we would have a new mindset, a new thought process, and that we would be prepared for an open heaven and, and receive everything that you have for us. God, we love you and we honor you, Father. I pray that you would just uh, continue to remind us each day of your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless, guys. Have a fantastic week.